Atta Man is counting on a dose of good, old-fashioned rock and roll this summer. Viva La Rock is already on the British charts and will be released soon in America. In the past, Ant built up a loyal following with an outlandish blend of wild costumes and stylish songs with a pounding beat. Atta Man joins us now on Nightwatch from London. Some people who have seen, have listened to Viva La Rock, which will be here, I guess, in the record stores in August or September, about the time you began an American tour, have s believe it has more of a traditional rock and roll feeling to it than some of the things you've done earlier. Is that true? Yeah, I think that's quite, uh, quite um, conscious, really, on my part, because I think... Uh People have seen the flamboyant side of uh, what I do, and now they're going to see more of the nitty-gritty side. Why that? We're better to... Why that change? Sorry? Why that transition? Um, well, I think it's always good to go back to roots, and I still like looking at early footage of uh, Elvis and all the early rock and roll, great American rock and roll stars. Um, and it, that was always with me. I just decided to uh, exploit that a bit and make it very simple to fit in line with the new lineup and everything, which is four pieces. Elvis was an influence. Oh, well, well, Elvis, uh, Gene Vincent, um, all that kind of stuff. But in this country, it manifested itself as, um, later on as the Beatles, and then uh, more the glam rock period with T-Rex and Roxy Music. And that's, that's about the period I was getting into music quite heavily and decided to put a group together. So it all sort of stemmed from there. You participated in, in Live Aid in London at Wembley Stadium. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you have some sense that it created a new excitement about rock and that it added something to uh, around the world to rock music yeah i do i think it was um where the musicians of the world both in in philadelphia and in london as well as all around europe and even in russia got together to you know try and put some kind of uh solution to a very very serious problem and i think the rock and roll grew up in public last week it grew up um, and it grew yeah, up i think rock and roll grew up in public. I think it, it grew up, um, you know, that day and was able to do something quite constructive. It was no longer just a very a flippant thing, just a, a pleasurable thing. It was something that was quite objective and worked, I think, splendidly. And it was an honor to be involved for me and everybody there. In a sense, rock and roll realized its power and applied it to something good and therefore yeah. achieved its maturity. Yeah, it wasn't self-indulgent in that respect. It was very giving. When you have artists the caliber of uh, Paul McCartney or The Who or, you know, Mick Jagger or Tina Turner going on with microphones that break and uh, having no sound check and really having to just go on and take pot luck, then you really have more of a regard for them and more of a respect that they were more concerned with solving the problem than promoting a record. And it was a great eye-opener for me, you know. I. I was very pleased to be involved. You know the rock and roll crowd, the people, uh, not only the artists, but the managers as well as the people who go. Is there still a sense, I mean, this week or two later, of the excitement of that day and that night and that moment? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, it took me a long time to come to terms with what had actually happened. Um, and even now, a, a week later, I, I just hope that feeling stays with me for the rest of my life. And every time I feel a little bit um, disillusion with the business or with what I do or with what I see to be being done I just hope to remember that day because the camaraderie and the spirit of everybody there was just unique everybody left fantastic. their egos at the door as they say oh yeah it was it was all left outside you know and um, collected on the way out or rather not collected I mean musicians left to themselves are just interested in music and entertaining people and performing and that's all everybody did and it was it was a real eye-opener for me, and I've been doing it for, well, not very long, but seven years, you know. You early on used video well. Uh, how did you understand the impact of video, which has come to play a prominent part in the marketing of music? Well, um, I can't really... I, I, I had no idea, I think, as everybody else did, how strong it would become. I remember the first time I ever did an advert for MTV was in a tiny little studio in the middle of... Uh, just outside of London and it was just picking a phone up and pointing at the camera and saying I want my MTV um, I had no idea I don't think anybody did just the scope that which visual music would be taken to heart by the, the public in America and worldwide it but just you know it gave it gave music a passport you know it was a, a passport to everybody's home 
Let's take a look at, at one of your own MTVs, Adam Ant, right here. Adam, when I look at that uh, music video, I think of those early influences. You used pirates. That was a pirate's uh, dress. And you also used American Indians and cowboys. Why? What was it, the sense of achieving some distinction visually while you were performing? Yeah, I just think I was drawing upon all the things that had influenced me as I'd grown up. Um, and I think that when I came to put a group together, suddenly there was a whole wealth of... Um, colour and costumes and things that I thought were very exciting to wear on stage in a rock and roll show. Um, I think this had, you know, the basis of this started, I think, with Elvis or, or even beyond there. Uh, but, you know, people like Alice Cooper were exploiting the idea of theatrical rock and roll a long time before I was involved. And I grew up on that kind of stuff. So when I had my chance, I, uh, I thought, well, there's this whole wardrobe of, of characters. Let's put some of it on. Um, and even now, what I'm doing now may seem just basically rock and roll to most people, but the way that uh, the stage show is being designed and the way the tours to take place, uh, there is an element of it that's futuristic and going forward. So, um, you know, I like very heroic, flamboyant characters in history, and right now I'm very intrigued by the whole uh, American space program, and as well as rock and roll. So it's kind of, there's a line in the album, rock is going Star Wars, um, and, and that manifests itself in that. So I'm... Um, I'm so we might I'm still see you. In so we might see you on stage in America in a space suit as you. I don't. I don't know about that. I'd love to do a video in Skylab. I think it would be a one, the best video ever made. I think it would be just wonderful. <laughs> I, I, I know that I sent. I, I dedicated my last record to Alan B. Shepard, um, and sent him the the trilogy of it uh, of it all because um, the, the the movie the right stuff really. Again, the same as those pirate movies, the same as any of the kind of flamboyant movies I'd seen and been influenced by. Years later, I'm still influenced by films that I think are very heroic and I think very colourful and exciting. And I think America, as a country, influenced me immensely because I, I grew up on, on, on cowboy films. I grew up on those kind of programmes. And uh, I just try to incorporate yeah. it into my work. It's interesting. The number one best-selling non-fiction book in America today is the biography of Chuck Yeager who was really? the predecessor, and you know from, from seeing the right stuff. We'll be right back. At a man. Talking about rock and roll and where it's going. Stay with us. Let me just come back as we talk about music and, and fashion. Does it... Does it, in a sense, substitute for the quality of the music, the show, the the scene, the, you know, if you've got a lot going on and it's very stylish, is in some ways that a substitution for good lyrics or and good sound? Um, unfortunately, I think nowadays perhaps that's the case. Um, I try to always substitute or always accompany all the videos and all the music and all the glamour with some good old nitty gritty touring which I think uh, I've done in America over the last two years to quite an extensive degree. Um, I think that the basis of a hit record and a, a success is, is a good song. I still think that. I think the song comes first, then the idea of the video, then maybe the clothes and all that kind of stuff. But I think the performance and the record and the performance of the record are the nitty gritty, the basic. And if they're not there, then the rest is not going to last. Is there a difference in the place that British rock is in comparison with where American rock is? What, right now? Yes. Are you guys um, ahead of where we are setting a trend? Are we doing that? Or are different people at different stages? Well, I think it's, a, it's like a creative ping-pong game that yeah. sometimes, you know, goes across. You have, you have America beginning it with Elvis, or even before that, you know, uh, Johnny Ray and Sinatra, then Elvis, then coming across Beatles back to America. Yeah. Elvis the, influenced the by people like Little Richard and a whole lot of others. Oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I mean, brilliant stuff. And, and uh, at the moment, the, the, the response to people like Bruce Springsteen in this country has been overwhelming. So at the moment, people are looking very much towards America and all the movies that are coming out of America. And I think there's a, I think America are, are winning at this point. So um, mm. 
you know, it make, it, it's nice. It, it's a sort of creative ping pong game. I like it. It's good. You obviously, you're an articulate young man. What's this? What's the secret of Springsteen? I mean, this extraordinary rock performer who, uh, more than anyone else, dominates music in America. The most popular singer in the world today who sold out in Ireland and in England and in his European uh -huh. tours coming here and tickets go on sale for one hour and they're all gone, you know, in a 65,000 uh, sitting stadium. What's the mm -hmm. secret to Springsteen? What's the appeal? I think the secret with Bruce Springsteen is that he has a talent coupled with an honesty and with a, a very simple approach to everything and he has the charisma of a, a film star and also he is He's very much, when you look at Bruce Springsteen, you see, I think, a lot of the good things about the USA, are possibly the good things about anybody involved in the music business, is he just gets up and works harder and with more, I don't know, care than anybody else. And I, I found going to America as an English performer, my main education was to sweat for the audience. You go out there and really sweat. People say to me, what are American audiences like? And I can only say, you know, to other bands going over there, they're great, but you've got to go out there and work, and that's what it's all about. You've got to go out there and sweat for them, yeah. and it, I, I like the idea of doing that, and that comes from Springsteen. And the reason that I wanted to do that many tours was that there's only Bruce up there working harder than anybody else, and he's been doing so for years before he ever had a hit record as well. So, I mean, he impressed me no end. Um, I think he represents everything great about rock and roll. Yeah. You really do say that well, because if you watch his... If you've been to one of his concerts, I mean, he gives and gives and gives. The audience feels like that he has laid it out there for them and has given them everything that he has, and he lies at the end exhausted because there is no more to give. Well, that's it. That's what it should be. I think it's a business where you're given a great deal of success, a great deal of fame, a great deal of money, sometimes very quickly, and it's lovely to know that you have got the belief in what you do and, and you pay back the audience, every single one of them. If there's 70,000 or seven, it doesn't matter. I think Bruce Springsteen would do the same show for three people yeah, as I he would too. for 30,000. 30, What's this about you and acting? Yeah, well, I, I took to the boards in, um, <laughs> in the, Royal, the Royal Exchange Theatre. Um, this last, uh, the last three months I did a, a season at the Royal Exchange Theatre to take part in a play called Entertaining Mr. Sloan by Joe Orton and I played the, uh, the lead role of um, Mr. Sloan who is a rather unpleasant young man, a um, bit of a psychopath and um, it was a great experience. I just wanted to see if I could uh, do it in the hardest circumstances and the hardest surroundings possible. And, uh, and what did you find out? <laughs> well, I found out that I enjoyed it, which is the main thing. And I found out that it was, um, I found out a little bit about the science of acting and about taking a, a play to bits and analysing every single word of it. And uh, now when I get given a film script, when people say, here, Adam, here's a, here's a film script we want you to be in, here's a film, I can decide whether, A, whether it's a good film script and B, whether I can do it or not, you know. Because the Royal Exchange is a theatre, Shakespearean theatre in the round and the audience sit around you. And it is really the hardest test. So I, I paid a bit of dues there. Might it be an additional career for you? Might you be moving away from music towards that? I mentioned only to you that the sort of emerging star is Tina Turner, who is just out with a film uh, with Gibson called Mad Max. Uh-huh. Um, also Madonna and Prince. Madonna I and think. Prince, exactly. But those two, there was a those two had more of a music orientation. I mean, Prince is uh, Purple Rain and also, well, Desperately Seeking Susan didn't necessarily have that much of a musical orientation. Well, I feel that, that it started really, I think the best example of a singer turning actor would be Frank Sinatra, especially with things like From Here to Eternity. And now you have people like Sting, who is also excellent. And I think that I would like to do roles that are either totally separate, separated from what I do as a singer, or do something that would allow me to portray a singer uh, of a different sort, a real singer, and show what it's really like. Um, perhaps the the less the less uh, admirable side of it all, um, and some of the more funny side of it as well. But um, just as long as it's it's work and constructive work, and it's something that is a good piece, a good a good script or a good director. That's what I'm after. I just want to work with good people because I love working. You know, that's what I like to do is work. So do I. Adam, thank you very much for joining us. Adam Ant from London. Uh, Viva La Rock, the new album. You'll be in the United States touring in the fall, sometime in the fall. October. October.
Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Night Watch continues. Stay with us.